You brought a Bible. Okay, good. Today, I would like for you to turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Proverbs 31. While you're turning, I want to tell you about a poem that was written, uh, actually published in the year 1865. Now, 1865 was the year that the Civil War ended, uh, when North was pitted against South right here in the United States, when the states were not so united, when North battled South and uh, family battled family, brother actually fought against brother, Christian, Christians fighting, killing other Christians. It was a horrific time in the history of the United States when the states were divided and uh, this terrible war killed. I just read an account the other day that said 530,000 men were killed in the Civil War, but then I read another account that said the final tally will never ever be known, but it could be as many as 700,000 men were killed during the Civil War. It was a terrible conflict, unlike anything the United States has ever experienced. But that same year that the war ended, a poem was published. A poem by a fellow uh, named William Ross Wallace. And the poem was titled, What Rules the World? What Rules the World? Uh, I guess people would automatically think, well, the Union Army just conquered the South when Lee surrendered at Appomattox. So obviously, maybe it was the Northern armies with its great navy. Maybe that's what rules the world. Or maybe now that the United States could be combined again and the division ended, maybe the combined might of the United States of America would really be united. Maybe that would rule the world. Or maybe it was the mighty British Empire, which was still in its heyday in that time. Maybe that's what ruled the world. But that's not what the poem said at all, and I, I'd like to read a little bit of it to you, if you don't mind. What rules the world? They say, a man is mighty, he governs land and sea, he wields a mighty scepter, or lesser powers than he, but a mighty power and stronger men from the throne, this throne has hurled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women, angels guard its strength and grace in the palace, cottage, hovel, oh, no matter where the place, would that never storms assailed it, rainbows ever gently curled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Woman, how divine your mission, here upon our native sod. Keep, oh, keep the young heart open always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women, fathers, sons, and daughters cry. And the sacred song is mingled with the worship in the sky, mingles where no tempest darkens rainbows evermore are hurled for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world that's pretty strong the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world you know the words of that poem were so moving that they move us still today in the early 1900s, one of the in the days of the silent movies, they made a silent movie by that name, "The Hand That Rocks the Cradle." And then I think in the 90s, some horror thriller was made by that name. That, uh, uh, but uh, several musicians have recorded songs by that title, uh, "The Hand That Rocks the Cradle," and, and it's it's been around, you know, for, for many many years. But Obviously, it's a tribute to motherhood and the influence of mothers that they have in shaping the next generation. Nobody shapes them more than their mothers. Nobody influences them more than you because you're with them from infancy 
till the remainder of their lives. Your words, your actions, your reactions, your love, all of that shapes a generation, shapes the way people think. It shapes, you shape the next generation of society by your influence, for good or for evil. And your influence can profoundly in influence your children uh, towards godliness, reverence, respect, or, or just the opposite. Because where the mother's influence is negligent, then you can see it in the generation that comes up. You can see it in the way they live, in the way they act, and in the way they speak. You know, ladies, don't ever, ever underestimate the power that you wield. You might think, I'm just a housewife. I'm just a, I'm an uneducated woman. You have tremendous influence and power in this world. Proverbs 31, are you there? Yeah. Then let me read a verse. Verse 28, the Bible says, Her children arise up. Proverbs 31, 28. This speaks of the godly mother, the virtuous mother, the virtuous woman. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. He praises her. I believe that uh, just as the children rise up and bless their mothers, for their love, their influence, their compassion, their cry. And husbands, you know, I do believe that every husband should praise his wife, uh, that we should be in their corner. He should be their number one cheerleader, encouraging them, blessing them. Twice in the Bible, twice in Proverbs, the Bible says, if you have a good wife, you have found favor from the Lord. You have been blessed by God. Good wife is a blessing from the Lord and something that we should appreciate all of our days. Husbands, he says, that her husband rises up and praises her. Look with me down in verse 10. I'm in Proverbs 31.10. Who can find a virtuous woman? Virtuous, godly, good. Some versions translate it valiant. Some translate it strong or excellent. Speaks of all of those things. The excellence of a virtuous woman, a godly woman. What a rarity. What a precious gem. What a treasure. Who can find such a woman? Her price, that is her value, her worth, is far above rubies. You, you can't compare it to any earthly treasure. A godly woman? The Bible says it's a gift from God himself. Now, how about that as a gift? A godly woman, a gift from God himself. Verse 12, how, oh, oh, I'm sorry, verse 11. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he, hell, he shall have no need of spoil. You won't have to go looking for uh, something to pillage or plunder. Your wife is going to look after you. That's the idea. You know, a godly wife looks, after, looks out for her husband. And vice versa. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. You have a wife like that, and you've got something. You've got a gift from God. And wives, this is the woman that you aspire to be, this godly woman, this reverent, virtuous woman, as the Bible refers to here. Strong. The word virtuous also means strong. Now, he's not talking about a woman who pumps iron. <laughs> it's talking about a woman strong in her faith. Strong in her conviction, strong in her morality. You're not going to bend this woman. You're not going to sway this woman. She's not going to be enticed by some chiseled chin, you know, guy making comp. She is strong 
in her commitment to Christ, her commitment to her husband, her commitment to her family. Husbands should praise them. Children should love, honor, appreciate them. Look with me down to verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. I love this verse. I love this that in her tongue is the law of kindness. Would to God that that would be a law in all of our tongues. The law of kindness. That when we speak it would be kind. That it would be gracious. That it would be merciful. That when we speak to each other it's not harsh, cruel, cutting, angry, bitter. Verse 27. She looketh well to the ways of her household. And eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. You know, the fifth commandment is that we ought to honor our fathers and our mothers. The Bible says we're to honor them, uh, that your days may be long on the land, upon the land that the Lord your God gives you. So attached to the command, fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Attached to that is a promise of long life, if you do. And not only that, but implied in the promise, not only long life, but good life. I mean, what good is it to do long life and you're a miserable, angry, cantankerous thing that nobody can stand to be around? No. The implication is a long, good life. Honor your mother and father. Respect them. You know, the Lord does not give us the privilege to take an eraser to the verses of Scripture that we don't like. Or to write over words so that we can modify them to suit us. Like we could say, you know, my mother was not like your mother. My mother was altogether different. My mother doesn't deserve respect and honor. Or my father doesn't deserve respect and honor because you don't know the father that I had. And while those things are true, because many parents have failed miserably, failed to be a decent parent, failed, some, some of your parents failed you miserably. Nevertheless, it's like our sister shared today, you cannot harbor hate in your heart. You have to let that go. You have to release that. You have to ask the Lord to forgive you and forgive them. And then if they're still alive and you can have a decent relationship with them, then I recommend you do your best to do that. If you have a living parent, you are, you are blessed. And I believe we should do whatever's in our power to maintain a decent relationship with them. I don't believe like that you cut off... Uh, a parent or a child or a brother or a sister. I don't believe that at all. Even if they're ungodly and vile and wicked and the most depraved human being on earth, you still love them and pray for them. And while you may have to overcome being around them, <laughs> and you may have to limit the time that you're around them, nevertheless, don't ever limit your prayer for them. And don't let your love for them be hindered. Because let me tell you, if you're not praying for them, nobody else is. It's You need to pray for them and love them. Absolutely. That honor that we extend to them, I want you to remember that's our responsibility from God. You can't modify that to suit you. Uh, we like to change the laws that don't suit us, you know. Uh, the police pull you over for speeding. You're going 75 and a 55. You're getting a ticket. You could say, you know what? That's a stupid law. I think it should be 75 right here. The policeman says, really? That's what you think? Well, here's your ticket. Take it up with the judge. <laughs> you, we don't have the liberty to change the law. Nor do we have the liberty to change what God has said. Here's what he said. You, you honor your father and your mother. And that's not something we should do just one day a year, but every day. 
every day. Every day. The hand that rocks the cradle. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Again, published in 1865, when that terrible, terrible war had ended, and so many women had lost sons, lost husbands, lost brothers. In fact, some women lost all of that. Maybe their only children were sons that were killed in that terrible war. Maybe they lost their husband at the same time and a brother at the same time. It was a terrible time in American history. Never before have we lost so many men. Never. We can't imagine it because it's 150 years removed from us. Maybe Bob can remember it, but most of us can. You know I love you, Bob. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that. Perhaps this writer wrote this poem at a time when there were so many tears, so much tragedy. Maybe, maybe he wrote thinking that mothers could use their considerable influence to just remind this next generation that life is too precious, that differences have to be able to be settled without bloodshed and violence, that maybe Maybe that was the intent. Mothers, use your influence to teach your children to respect other people's lives. Respect their property. Don't think only of yourself. I mean, I would imagine that that had to be in the mind and thinking of the writer. It's also a tragedy that it's a lesson or a message that's certainly been lost on our own generation because you can't pick up the newspaper in any city without seeing reports of more homicides. Just this past year, after homicide rates in the United States kind of went down just a little bit for a couple of years, they're back up again. Over 16,000 homicides in the United States last year. And there's no sign of that number falling off. We're losing a generation of young men, especially young black men in our inner cities. I believe it also reflects on the sad state of motherhood in general. You know, here in the United States, we live in 21st century America. 21st century America. I want you to consider that the influence of the Bible on society is waning. It is waning. And as that godly influence wanes, human kindness is waning as well. Just normal human courtesies, kindness, compassion, generosity, sympathy, all of these things seem to be waning. And then, also as a result of this, marriage itself has fallen on hard times. It's actually spurned now by multitudes of people who simply choose to live together rather than get married. They just cohabit. Many times cohabiting and bearing children, not even bothering to get married anymore, and not realizing the repercussions that these actions have on that generation of children and on society as a whole. I'm, I don't think we should be surprised that motherhood, motherhood, has fallen on hard times. I, not that fatherhood hasn't. But, you know, a godly mother is as rare as a godly father. Amen. There's not enough of either one of them. Both are very precious, precious gems. But I don't believe we live in a society that actually, honestly, honors mothers. And the fact is, I think we could probably say many of them are not very honorable. Many are not very honorable people. You know, in 2013, the Center of Disease, CDC, Center of Disease Control, said that over 40% of American babies were born out of wedlock. Over 40%. Now, this is a national trend. It's just that number gets bigger every year. 
It's also trending all over Europe uh, and, and parts of the Western world. In some ethnic groups, the number is far higher. Some as high as 70% of children are born to unwed, unwed parents. Uh, the United Kingdom, uh, our, our closest ally, I guess you'd have to say, they said that by 2016, over 50% of their births would be to unwed mothers. Over 50%. And, and America's right behind them. Uh, unmarried mothers propagating and, and people not thinking of the repercussions or the long-term consequences of this. You see, society itself is like a, a garment and we have pulled the threads that hold it together and begun unraveling the threads of society. You know what happens when you pull that thread? The garment itself just begins to disintegrate. That's what we have done in American society. The more we move away from God, um, away from Scripture, away from a foundation in Christianity, the more our society unravels, the more crime escalates, the more we see people mistreating one another, the more cruelty, the less kindness. I think you pretty much would have to be deaf, blind, dumb, uh, and oblivious to fail to see that we are living on the precipice of a national and international disaster because of the unraveling of our society. Uh, the family itself as an institution, remember, an institution ordained by God Himself. God Himself ordained that society would be held together, propagated by families, families, family units. That's what comprises family, church, society, government. Without it, everything else unravels. And consider the repercussions to the children that are born, born so haphazardly uh, as though the parents don't even bother to marry anymore. How we treat marriage so offhanded, so inconsequential, so unnecessary, and we don't realize that we ourselves are pulling the threads that are unraveling society. The sad fact is that many of these children that are born in such a way will never know their father. Not only will they never know their father, they'll never know the influence of a good man and a godly, the godly guidance of a godly man. Amen. They will never know such a thing. Most of them will never know it. You think that has consequence on that generation? It was God who said that a family would be comprised of a mother and a father. Amen. That's the way he designed it to be. The stability of society itself rests in the family, a family that unfortunately has unraveled. Also, as a result of this, many, if not most, of these children born under such circumstances will be raised in poverty. It's not a secret that the poverty rate of unmarried mothers is more than double that of their married counterparts poverty rate of unmarried mothers is is horrible absolutely horrible and you add to that all the additional you know mothers have enough responsibilities as it is but add to that the responsibility of trying to be a father as well as a mother which you can't do I say shame on us all shame on men for the way we treat women in our society I try not to hear the music when the guy pulls up next to me in his car. If my windows are down, I want to roll them up. If I can still hear it, I'll turn the radio high because I don't want to hear all, you know, what they're saying. But when you do hear it, it's always denigrating to women. Always. Women are just treated as objects of lust, traded, bartered, make a baby with them. Many of these men leave trails of babies everywhere they go. 
They're not fathers, not by any stretch of the imagination. Shame on fathers for their neglect. Shame on these young mothers for being so gullible. Shame on us all. You know, we've turned away. Our problem is we've turned away from the Bible standard of morality. We've turned away from Bible instruction. Here's what Scripture teaches. Here's how we must live. We've turned away from that because we said we don't want to live that way. We don't want to live in those boundaries. We want to do what we want to do. The result has been a total collapse in decency, a total collapse in morality, a collapse in marriage. What did we think would happen? I mean, really, what did we think would happen? Have you ever stood at the bedside of a young man or a young woman who was dying, dying from a drug overdose? And their father or their mother taught them everything they knew about how to use drugs. And now they're looking at their son dying of an overdose, maybe not be able to be resuscitated. And everything in you wants to scream out and say, what did you think would happen? What did you think would happen? When you live this example in front of that boy, when you live this example in front of that daughter, what did you think was going to happen? When you're a liar and you're a thief and you're a cheat and you're a no good, what kind of child do you think you're going to raise? I mean, what do you think is going to happen when they wind up in jail, they wind up dead, they wind up in a gutter, they wind up a drug addict? What do you think? We think our actions have no consequences. We think only of ourselves, our appetites, wants, desires. We don't think that we're influencing a generation. You see, the hand that rocks the cradle is a hand that influences those children so profoundly. So profoundly. What do we think our actions are going to do? The children that are raised without morality, that are raised without respect, for others, respect for other people's property, respect for other people's lives. You are offending society by breeding monsters who will be predators. Unless they get saved. That changes everything. Praise God. The Lord changes everything. You know, I have some statistics here. I could just read a little bit of it. Um, this is from the Heritage Foundation. If you want to read something really shocking, just go online, look up the Heritage Foundation and the consequences of our society's unraveling and, and the, what's happening with unwed mothers giving birth, fathers not marrying the mothers, and so on. Children raised without a father, real quick, more than twice as likely to be arrested as a juvenile. More than twice as likely to be treated for emotional and behavioral problems. We're talking about children raised without fathers. More than twice as likely to be suspended or expelled from school. One third more likely to drop out of school. Then what kind of opportunities do they have? Drop out of school, no education, no skills, no respect for other human beings. Really, what have we bred? We've bred predators because the only way they can live is to rob steal and plunder and those effects continue on into adulthood because children from broken homes or single parent homes are three times more likely to wind up in jail by the age of 30 as opposed to those who remain in an intact married home. Now look, I know that we can't undo the past. You can't change what's happened in your life and I certainly don't want to condemn anyone today for what's going on in your past life, your previous life before Christ because you can't go back in time and undo those things. You can't undo past mistakes. 
what you can do is no longer repeat them. You can live today the way God would call you to live. You can use the rest of your life as a godly influence. You can ask the Lord to forgive you. And you know He does. He does forgive us. And He turns, he turns people who were once monsters into mothers and fathers and decent human beings. These are things we witness. These are things we see the Lord do. I mean, He's changed our lives. Think of what He's done, he's done with us. I like to use my father-in-law as an example, a man who I called a grizzly bear. God turned him into a teddy bear. <laughs> that's, that's what grace does. Turned him from an angry man to a man who was learning how to be gentle and kind and compassionate. But, you know, also that girls raised without fathers are more than twice as likely to repeat their mother's errors and repeat the cycle. The government itself doesn't help the situation because they punish married people. It's, it's one of the saddest things I know, but it's true. The government actually punishes marriage so that married people pay more taxes. They're entitled to far less benefits. Uh, there are all laws that discourage marriage, many laws that discourage marriage, because the government will offer help and subsidies and so forth to the unmarried, but you're disqualified automatically for them if you're married. Uh, I've read so many reports of these things, it's, it's tragic. Uh, older couples, let me give you just an example, have been denied certain benefits or, or public assistance um, because they were married. One person that most of you know, my cousin Brian, pastors a church in Laplace. Let me, let me tell you the wise advice the government gave him when his wife applied for assistance. They said, well, this is what you should do. Divorce your husband. Because you know you don't qualify for any assistance. But if you divorce your husband... Then you qualify for this, for this, and this. And then you all just live together. Let me tell you. Do you know how often that process gets repeated every single day? To couple after couple after couple. We discourage marriage in our society. To discourage it. Our own government discourages it. Imagine that. Divorce your husband, you qualify for benefits, and then you all just live together. Uh, you fall under a divine curse, but you know the government will help you out. So whose help would you rather have? And you know what Brian and, and uh, Joanne said, well, you know what? No, thank you. That, that's what it requires? No, thank you. The Lord will provide for us. Praise God. And the Lord does provide for them. You can, you can follow the world's way. You know, you just live together, you get more benefits. But God will judge you for it. Amen. He will not bless you for it. You will not prosper for it. Absolutely not. You cannot sin against God and think, well, you know, I'm doing it because of the benefits. The benefits? Well, we know what you value most then. We know what you value most. The Lord has to be first, you know, in everything. We put Him first. Obedience first. He will bless. Amen. Submission to the Lord first. Then trust Him to bless you and provide for you. Amen. So if you don't think all of this is bad enough, as far as the unraveling of the family, to make society even worse, it seems like we are racing to approve homosexual marriage and make same-sex marriage the, the national, uh, nationally approved and recognized, which will only accelerate society's demise and America's demise. Uh, in fact, I believe it will ensure uh, the wrath of God upon America. We're, we're too far gone already. Unless something supernatural happens, some supernatural wind of revival sweeps through America, just on a national scale, 
we are so far gone. We have so far abandoned God and morality of every kind. You know what's waiting in the wings is polygamy. Once the doors are open, once we redefine marriage, it's anything goes. It's Katie bar the door because anything can happen now. Uh, you probably heard about the lady who wanted to marry her dog. In fact, one did marry her dog in, a, uh, in another country. Uh, we've got others who want to marry their mother or marry their father. I remember seeing a debate on television where, where this ungodly TV commentator was taking a Christian apart, just tearing him apart, saying, well, you deny people the their right to love somebody the way <coughs> that you love somebody. You don't give them their fair rights. You, you want to deny them their rights. And the Christian answered and said, actually, they have the same right that I have. They were talking about homosexuals who want to marry. They said, you deny them the right or the privilege, the privilege that you have. He said, actually, I don't. They have the same right that I do. They can marry any woman that will have them. <laughs> uh, but the answer by the TV commentator was, but yeah, but you say they can't marry the person they love. See, that's what you say. They can't marry the person they love, which was, in this case was another man. Now, the, d the debate kind of went downhill from there, but I was hollering at the screen <laughs> saying, why don't you answer by saying, well, what if you say you want to marry your mother or you want to marry your father? Should that be allowed? What if you say, I love them, I want to love them? Or what if you say, I want to marry two people or five people? Yeah. Yeah. See, once you open these floodgates, society is unraveled. I mean, I think we've lost our minds, to be honest with you, as a nation. I think we've lost our minds. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. No man can be another man's wife. No man can be another man's husband. No woman can be another woman's wife. No woman can be another woman's husband. I mean, you can pretend and play house. And even if the government endorses your lifestyle, <coughs> you are not a family. That is not a family. And that never will be a family. Not in the eyes of the Lord. And you know what? You don't even have to be a Christian to know that. Biology tells you that. Amen. Common sense tells you that. Thousands of years of human existence tells you that. And the Lord Jesus Christ sure tells us that. When He defined marriage, you know, He defined it very clearly actually endorsing the Old Testament declaration of what marriage is. Matthew 19. You don't have to turn here. You can if you like, but if you do turn here, keep your finger in Proverbs 31. I want to read a few verses from Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 4. They were asking the Lord about divorce and marriage. And He answered and said unto them, Matthew 19, 4, have you not read? Now he's talking about in the Old Testament. Haven't you read your Bible? Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning? Now who was that that made them at the beginning? That was God. He that made them at the beginning made them male and female. That's how he made them. That was the divine design. God made them male and female. And you know what? He made one of each. Verse 5, Matthew 19, 5. And for this cause, now he's talking about, in the context, they're talking about marriage. For this cause, for the cause of marriage, of family, of society, shall a man leave father and mother. Now man, that's male. And he shall cleave to his wife. That's female. And they too, the two of them, so marriage is two. One man, one woman. One male, one female. The two shall be one flesh. The two shall be one. Not three, not four, not five, but two shall be one. Wherefore, they are no longer two, but one flesh. That's what marriage is. Two become one. That's a family. 
And wherefore, what God has joined together. See, this is the divine design. Let no man put asunder. To put it asunder would be to divide it or to destroy it. And you can destroy it by trying to redefine it. So what God joins together, you know, that's a family. We see it very clearly. One man, one woman, they forsake all others. They cling to each other. They marry before God and man. And this is a relationship where the husband loves, nurtures, cherishes his wife and provides for her. And for their children and the wife, honors, loves, respects, care for, cares for her husband and looks after the family and their household. And here's what Proverbs 31, you're still there? Proverbs 31, 27 says, She looketh well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She is virtuous. Verse 10 says, She is a virtuous, strong, excellent woman. A woman of power and grace. Women are a powerful force. Don't ever, don't ever doubt that. They are powerful. Amen. And their influence is far more reaching than most of us realize. Right. And a woman of courage, a woman that will stand up for truth and right. And I love this. Verse 11, She is loyal. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. She is loyal and faithful to her husband. She does not have a wandering eye or a wandering heart. He is able to trust her completely. There is no need of spoil. Again, spoil in the, in the Old Testament referred to gain or plunder. Sometimes if somebody needed something, they'd go out and conquer a neighboring tribe and take their spoil. Well, when you have a godly woman, a virtuous woman, you don't have to be worried about all of that because... The Lord provides for you and your wife. She's looking after you. She's committed, verse 12. She'll do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She is rock solid. What a, what a treasure. And you know what else? You read these following verses. Verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 20. She is busy. <laughs> She seeks wool and flax. She works willingly with her hands. She's like the merchant ship, bringing her food from afar. She rises up while it's yet night, gives meat to her household, a portion to her maiden. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. This woman is an entrepreneur. I mean, she's busy. She is active. She is not a lazy person. She girds her loins with strength. And Strengthens her arms. She perceives her merchandise is good. Her candle doesn't go out by night. This isn't a lady sitting up watching soap operas and eating bonbons all day. She is busy. She lays her hands to the spindle. Her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She reaches forth her hands to the needy. This is a generous lady, a gracious lady, a kind and compassionate lady. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all of her household is clothed with scarlet. The idea here is they are well clothed. She's, she looks after her family, in other words. She looks after them. They're more important than she, she is herself. This, a mother, you know, that's just the way a mother is. A mother's going to make sure the kids have, even if the mother has to not have. I wrote something down here about some of the things. Look, we may not... In our society, ladies, I'm sure you're not doing all those things. But that doesn't mean you're not busy. You play many roles and wear many hats. You know, a mother is a nurse, a doctor, a caregiver, a teacher, an instructor. I mean, really, mothers, from, from the very first, from how to walk to how to talk to how to go on the potty, Disciplinarians, guides, advisors, confidants, friends, protectors, guardians, cook, housekeeper, janitor, launderer, arbiter of all disputes. Imagine if we had to pay them for all that they do. Verse 26 says, she opens her mouth with wisdom. 
and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Godly woman, full of wisdom. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She looks after her household well. Verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. And notice this verse, verse 30. Favor is deceitful. The word there is sometimes translated charm, grace, uh, excellence, elegance. It, it's deceitful. That is, you can see a very elegant woman. I mean, she may be dressed to the nines and she may look so elegant. But what you don't see is that she could be evil. <laughs> She could be Cruella de Vil. So elegance, this exterior air of charm, many a charming voice hides a sinister heart. And he goes on and says, not only is favor deceitful, beauty is vain. That is, you know, it doesn't really last. Uh, it's temporary in and of itself. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. She shall be praised. How important to the family is a God-fearing woman. How vitally important to the church, how vitally important to society is a woman who fears the Lord. Abraham Lincoln once said, no man is poor who had a godly mother. And verse 31, give her the fruit of her hands. Let her own works praise her in the gates. The old rabbis translated this to say that these are actually, verse 31, the words of her husband speaking to the children and saying, you give your mother the credit, the honor, the praise, the respect that she deserves. You give her what she deserves. Let her own works, her own reputation for godliness and purity and faithfulness. Let that go before her. Let that trail behind her. And let all who know her honor her. Just like we honor mothers today. All mothers. Thankful for them. Thankful for you. Ladies, you are a powerful force. Don't ever doubt it. You are powerful. In your own influence, in your words, in your actions, in your reactions. You teach every day. You teach. You don't know it, but you teach. You teach us all. You teach us grace and honor and dignity. You teach us respect. You teach us restraint. You teach us honor. Teach us well. I want to finish this morning with a quote from a wise sage, a well-known philosopher that some of you may remember. His name was Milton Berle. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to give you this as absolute concrete proof that evolution is false. All you have to do is remember this astute quote from Milton Berle. He said, if evolution really works, if evolution really works, why is it that mothers still only have two hands? <laughs> For all the things they do, all the things they juggle, all their jobs and tasks, if evolution was true, surely mothers would have four or five hands. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we pray today and we, we thank you, Lord, for our mothers. We thank you, Lord, for the influence of, of these ladies, all of these ladies this morning. I ask you to bless them. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to comfort them. Lord, where we failed, we ask you to forgive. And Lord, we ask you to help, help us one and all to be the example we should be. 
that godly influence. Father, bless every mother with all the guidance and wisdom and grace she needs to exercise this godly influence all the days of their lives as we honor them, Lord, and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.